So I am Mathieu, and working at Speaky for like eight years, eight years and a half, and uh, application specialist. And I would like to speak about fabric recy recycling. It may sound a little bit exotic because usually for recycling we are talking more about plastics, papers, these kind of things. But what about fabrics? Like you know what we have on us? Everybody uses it, and I'm sure you don't know where your fabric is actually going once you throw them away. And that's actually where I'm going to speak about. Maybe that's it. Yeah, fabrics, they are used everywhere, and they are really kind of. I'm sure if we have a look all around us, even on myself, we have some which are based on animal or vegetation, like leather, or it could be also wool, it could be silk, those are for the animal based. But it could also, also be like cotton, linen, which is more like vegetation based. Of course, there are the synthetics, polyamines, nylons, they are the same actually, polyesters. So you cannot treat them as the same way, as they don't have the same characteristics and properties. And then to make things even more difficult, we like to mix them together. You know, it's like you have wool with polyamide, for example, then it's even more tricky. The problem is that most of the used clothes and textiles they end up in landfills. Not necessarily in Europe, because we don't like to see them in our, in our backyard, but we like to send them away. And they finish in landfill, which is sad. And actually, we would like to, re to, to recycle them because it's really resource consuming. Think about cotton. Cotton requires a lot of water to be grown, and it is also really hard work to be harvested. If you think where the cotton is grown nowadays, it's like in Uzbekistan, or the southern states of the United States, where there's not that much water, actually. And here, it would actually be really environmental friendly if we could recycle them. And there are some which can be used again, like cotton. You could make paper based on cotton. Think about it. On average, there is about a clothes when it's thrown away, it's thrown away only after seven use. You use your clothes seven times, and then it's thrown away. This is the average. For some people, it's even less. For some people, like me, <laughs> it could be much more. But this is an average. This is really little when you think about it. But since 2018, actually, the European Union decided that we should have some rules to recycle them to acknowledge this environmental issue. And by 2025, actually, we will have to recycle our fabrics. That means that actually there is a market which is coming for the fabric recycling. And even if you see there is not that high amount of money, at least the AU will inject a lot of money in these kind of things. And if AU is doing that, you can be sure that the other will follow afterwards. Maybe not in 25, maybe 30, but still. Which is tomorrow. Unfortunately, the current solution is manual. It's manual work. It is slow and it requires know-how. And there is a lot of repetitivity. Imagine if you are someone, you have two sort different types of fabric, you do that seven hours in a row. I'm sure you cannot maintain the same level of accuracy during seven hours like this. And there is a reproducibility as well. Maybe the person A can classify or can sort one fabric as one type, and the person B can sort it as well as another type. This is not so easy, but it is sorted at the same manner. This is not really hygienic. Normally, the fabrics are washed before to be recycled, but you never know. And fabric can be really dirty. And then there is an issue with accuracy. If you go to our booth, for example, we have cotton, wool, and polyester. Polyester is really easy to sort, to take it apart from the other. When you touch it, it's really different. But wool and cotton, it can be really tricky sometimes. Especially if you put some additive or some mixture, how can you separate them just by touching or by looking? It's almost impossible. And the cost is high in the long term. The solution, what we propose, is to actually use NIR high-tech spectral camera. I heard this morning there was a really nice presentation by Gerhardt about high spectral imaging to explain what it was. So I will just quickly speak about it. 
Just to say that it is really suitable for machine vision, it is contactless. You don't need to touch anything. It is non-destructive as well. It can be automated, meaning you can have a conveyor belt and then pickers to pick up actually the flow, which is quite fast, much faster actually than people doing it manually. There is no need for maintenance. And it's very accurate because it's really repeatable and it's always done in a, an objective way. It's not subjective anymore. Actually, when we started to speak about this fabric recycling with our camera, the Finnish parliament, because we are a Finnish company, and the Finnish parliament heard about us, invited us actually to show our solution to the deputies, and they really liked it. So, we move forward with this. A high spectral camera would look like this. This is the FX10. I have to say for this application, it would be better to use an FX17. An FX17 is between 900 and 1,700 nanometers. It means really in the infrared. This one, the FX10, is between 400 and 1,000 nanometers. It's more suitable for the color, but we want to be independent of the color. We want to sort the material, the fabric, for what they are, but you don't want to sort the fabric for the color. So here, better to use actually an FX17. It's necessary to have actually an illumination, and you can see our camera trees are line light. So that means that you have a line where you make an each pixel of the line, actually, you extract what we call spectrum. A spectrum looks like this, once it is normalized, <coughs> and each material, they have different spectrum. And then you can recognize different material based on the fingerprint. For example, spectrum of the material A could have this shape, spectrum of the material B could have this shape, and then, if you put a sample that you don't know what it is, just by the spectrum, you try to find what is the closest match with some statistical models here. Here, I will present a study that we have made, actually with our FX70, which is the NIR camera, as I was explaining, on our last scanner. The last scanner includes actually the halogen illumination, and a sample tray, which is suitable to put sample as large as 40 by 20 centimeters. We made the analysis not with the staking software, but with the software provided by Perception Park. The name of the software is Perception Studio, and actually here, Stemmer acts as an integrator somehow, that they take the camera from us, they take the software from Perception Park, and they are able to build the solution as we just did for this analysis. And I took into account different <coughs> types of textile, natural, and also synthetics. Here is a set of samples. As a synthetic ones, I took some acrylic, polyesters, based on animals' lung. Well, there were lung, merino, and alpaca wool, different types of wool. Here, there was another one here, and here with a bit of mixture. Also, plant fiber. We measure some linen and cotton. Oh, I forgot to mention, there was silk. Silk we consider it's kind of animal based. And then there was some mixture, cotton with nylon, and wool with polyester. And here, I would like to highlight that some of the sample, they were even black. Here it's important because when we speak about recycling, very often people think about plastic recycling. And when we deal with plastic recycling, the NIR spectral camera is blind somehow because to make plastic dark, we insert some atom of carbon and then nothing to see, at least in the NIR. But when we are talking about fabric, those are dyeing lotion. So it's not based on carbon. So actually, in the NIR spectral range, this is not black at all. And here are the spectra that actually we observe. And you can see there are some differences, but also some similarities. The first one here is acrylic. And you can see it's very close, actually, from the polyester. So you can see that those two synthetic ones, which are the only ones that I take into account in this study, they really have some nice and sharp spectral features. Usually, when you have natural material, it's much more smooth, the spectral features. But when it is synthetic, you often have those nice peaks after 1600 nanometers. Then, the cotton, you have one type here and another type. Those are the two light blue ones. They really follow nicely. And actually, they are quite close from the linen. 
So cotton and linen, I would say to separate both of them is really tricky. But both of them, they have something in common. They are both based on vegetation. So their spectral response will actually be put in one single class. And here, you have the wool from the lawn, alpaga and merlin, alpaga and merlin, you can see, those are the green one. They follow really nicely from each other. And finally, there is a seed, which is in yellow. So based on that, we will see that there are many three classes. The synthetic ones, cotton and linen, seed, and as well as separately, so good. So already when you can separate those ones, it's a really good step forward. And here, we decided to look at the data, not only the spectrum, but the data as an image. So as I was explaining, the hyperspectral image, so for each pixel there is a continuous spectrum. And if we do the derivative already of the spectra, we can obtain this kind of image. And we can see a lot of diversity already. Notice that sometimes, because we're in the NIS spectral range, when you have some drawing, like here some square, you don't see them anymore. Here's a stripe, you barely see them again. Here's a circle, you don't see them anymore. Of course, because these are made on ink, which is for the visible textual range, and again, okay, the NIS textual range. And once we have pre-processed the data with the derivative, we want to build the model. And actually, the samples that I use for calibration are the one I highlighted by this in white. So I took a few pixels from this sample made of acrylic, two pixels of poly, uh, polyester. Same for cotton, linen, silk, and wool. Every time it was only a few pixels. It's about five to 10. And then, actually, it was possible to get a model and to get a classification. What do we observe? Quite many they are classified actually in green. Does it make sense? Polyester, 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 polyester. Yes, they do make sense. This one was also polyester. It is nicely classified. If I look at them for the cotton and the linen, you remember, I made the model only with that one and that one. This one, the next one here, was classified as cotton. And indeed, it is again classified as cotton. This one as well. And the two at the bottom. This one was 100% cotton. We have it was an issue. And this one was also an issue. But still, with the dominance of cotton, it was more than 60% as cotton. And then for the silk and the wool, again, the classification is quite correct. I would say only the last one here is a bit more problematic. It was wool, 70%, and polyester. Well, it is not either polyester, neither wool, but still, it is classified as a separate. So I would say for the mixture one, there should be different classes here. As a conclusion, what can we say? Hyperspectral imaging, indeed, it is suitable to separate different types of fabric because they have different types of materials. Um, regardless of coloration, as you have seen, if they are black, not black, different types of colors, actually it doesn't matter anything because you really highlight actually the material with a hyperspectral camera. And it opens really new opportunity if you think about recycling market where actually there is only little of application which is done for this once. If you have any questions, please.